What is up to all my Cormac McCarthy fans out there? Today we are talking about the crazy Ezra Pound and Cormac McCarthy. And McCarthy was heavily influenced by the modernists. And I love talking about modernist poetry. If you look at a lot of the earlier videos on this channel, they are mostly about poetry. And in the Cormac McCarthy course, which is located at Cormac McCarthy dot substack dot com and it costs five dollars a month i have a video that's over 30 minutes detailing modernist poetry's influence on cormac mccarthy's prose but today we are talking about ezra pound because he appears in mccarthy's screenplay whales and men and appears so much so that a bunch of characters are sitting around the fire and one reads a dylan thomas poem and then someone asks do you read that pound poem? And someone says, pound as in Ezra Pound. And McCarthy inserts a full poem that's not that short into the manuscript, which I think is pretty funny. And this is actually one of Pound's better poems, so I'm actually glad that we're able to read this together. So let's hop into it. The River Merchant's Wife, A Letter, After Lee po by Ezra Pound. While my hair was still cut straight across my forehead, I played about the front gate, pulling flowers. You came by on bamboo stilts, playing horse. You walked ab about my seat, playing with blue plums. And we went on living in the village of Chokan, two small people, without dislike or suspicion. At 14, I married, my lord, you. I never laughed, being bashful. Lowering my head, I looked at the wall. Called to a thousand times, I never looked back. At 15, I stopped scowling. I desired my dust to be mingled with yours forever and forever and forever. Why should I climb the lookout? At 16, you departed. You went far into far Kuktu N by the river of swirling eddies, and you have been gone five months. The monkeys make sorrowful noise overhead. You dragged your feet when you went out. By the gate now, the moss has grown. The different mosses, too deep to clear them away. The leaves fall early this autumn in wind. The paired blood butterflies are already yellow with August over the grass in the west garden. They hurt me. I grow older. If you are coming down through the narrows of River Kayang, please let me know beforehand, and I will come out to meet you as far as Chufusa. So this brings up one of my favorite topics, which is Chinese wilderness and rivers poetry, which I think is some of the greatest poetry of all time. And Pound here is translating Li Ba, a.k.a. Li Po, and he calls him Li Po. That's what I call him also. And so Po is such a Po. Poe is such a, who would have thought, is such a magical author because he embodies this concept of in Taoism called Su Zhan or sometimes called Zuran, which talks about at some level spontaneity, but really being able to just be in tune and aligned with what's happening, being a present person in the phenomenological moment. And this was a big part of Lee's life because he wasn't like a, a huge hermit out in the woods. He did drink. He loved to travel and he was a bit of a rebel. He is somewhat akin to Ikkyu, who is a very famous Zen monk in Japan. And he was known for going to brothels and drinking wine, but he was so talented and spontaneous that he was, you know, achieving, achieving different, uh, very high levels of enlightenment. And it's said, and I know this is a tale, that he was so spontaneous that one night while he was out on a boat, he was so drunk that he was trying to hug the moon and fell into the river and ended up dying. So I'm going to show you guys and we're going to examine this poem. And I'll, I'll tell you guys up front that McCarthy actually writes and is inspired by the Chinese poets a bunch. If you look at McCarthy's published poems, yes, in his high school newspaper, they actually vary Chinese in nature. And on the screen right here is McCarthy's first published work, a poem named Autumn's Magic. And it starts, the sun was slowly breaking through the chilly, misty dawn, and the fog upon the river lifted, faded, soon was gone. And that's as close to a Chinese poem as you're going to get from a 16-year-old. We have a heavy emphasis on nature with a double contrast within. You know, the sun is breaking through this misty, cold river, and then suddenly the fog fades and is gone. And so something when examining Chinese poems is that there really is no purpose a lot of the time. This one is a much more direct poem. Obviously, it's talking about a river merchant's wife, but throughout it, we see very beautiful breaks into, into nature. And sometimes a lot of Li Po's work is more just about the natural world, and it embeds emotion and meaning within, but you have to find it. It's something that you feel. It's a, It creates that spontaneous change. And so now, if we look at Pound's translation... This is something I teach my students all the time. It's called the it's called the four line stanzas. So the first three lines 
or where you write a poem. And this is like, this is classic Chinese. This is a classic Chinese tactic right here. So you do something that has like a purpose. But then at the end, you do kind of a random nature metaphor. And this one connects pretty well, but some are really disconnected. And it says the monkeys make sorrowful noise overhead. And this is obviously alluding to the sadness that she is feeling because her husband has been gone for five months. But we are integrating nature into the piece. This doesn't happen as often in modern American poetry and just modern poetry in general. You don't see, and we stood up and protested all the blank, 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 period. The desert tortoise finds a place to rest for the night. You have to have an appreciation of nature and understand, like the Chinese poets did, that it's something to contrast with, that nature has within it a lot of unconscious elements for us that we can unlock. And this is, I think, why McCarthy has such heavy nature prose in his work, because his uh, mentors, idols, literary people he looked up to, the German idealist Jacob Bohm, Schelling, a lot of the mystics he's into, they believe that through the contemplation of nature, we can start to discover the dark parts of God, which sounds very McCarthyan indeed. And for anyone that's into Chinese art and stuff, a lot of the landscape art at this time also really makes nature very significant because you'll see a town or a village or people walking, but they're minuscule. The main focus is the nature, and they are triumphing it over na uh, over the people. As in a lot of Western art, nature may be involved, but unless it's just a purely a landscape painting, the people, the humans, have a much more central ro role in the art. And so another tactic you, you see also is that it starts off very... Uh, character centric right we have the character she's talking about herself but as we move on it starts to get more whim whimsical i desired my dust to be being with yours that's the now she moves into nature in this stanza and then in this stanza she starts to almost switch between herself and nature and this is also another tactic you either start with nature and rise into the character centricity or you start character centric and then you move into nothingness by the end and this is really symbolizing the movement of the mind, the movement of the unconscious when in contact with nature. And this is this is how I like to write. Like I said, it's not very popular. I'll, I write a bunch of poems like these and give them to my poetry uh, people to edit or people to look at. And they always want more. They're always asking for more. And like, obviously, I'm good enough to write more and make it more maximalist or add more beautiful prose to it. But it's like, no, this is supposed to be minimal. This is supposed to be kind of an interplay of nature and the mind. But obviously, that's not something our culture really has been taught, understands. And so, you know, I don't want to be the asshole to be like, you don't understand this. So eventually, I'm actually going to release a collection. I'm working on them right now. I have so many. It's going to be a huge book of desert Chinese poems because I live in the desert, lived in the desert my entire life. And so I'm doing kind of a Chinese-inspired uh, poetry book because I have all these inspired poems that I know just won't work well in a traditional poetry collection because I have all this other poetry that could be said is like it's modern or is recognizable and enjoyed by all different types of poetry lovers. So anyway, when we look at this last stanza, you dragged your feet when you went out. By the gate now, the moss has grown. The different mosses to, too deep to clear them away. So we have a, a nature metaphor here. The leaves fall early this autumn in wind. The paired butterflies are, are already yellow with August over the grass in the West Garden. They hurt me. I grow older. You are coming down through the narrows of the river Kayang. Please let me know beforehand, and I will come out to meet you as far as Chu Fusa. And in the story, this is how it starts. There's a little bit of commentary before what have I already told you. Actually, it's a translation from the Chinese, or it's a transliteration, perhaps. It's in the form of a letter from a young wife to her husband who was away on a business trip. The poet is Rihaku, which is another name for Li Po. And then if we go down, after he finishes, the last three lines have moved Peter to the point where he falters just slightly with the words. The silence that follows is somewhat embarrassed. Kelly is watching Peter. Peter closes the book in his lap, which in any case did not contain this poem, and puts it on the table and looks at his guest. Yes, well, some poems rather are rather hard to say, aren't they? Well, that's your lot. I'm taking orders for Brandy's. That's what I love about Whales and Men. It's one of the books with some of the only modern references. Like in The Passenger and Stella Maris, we finally got some. But in Whales and Men, we hear about classical music and like all these kind of random things that we never, we know McCarthy's into, but we never really hear him talk about. So I'll be going over a lot of this over the coming week. I've actually reread 
Whales of Men and I'm inspired to make more content about it because it's underread, underutilized, and contains more about McCarthy's thoughts on God, language, and other things than almost any other book that he's written. So I will see you guys then, and thank you for being here. If you guys want a Cormac McCarthy t-shirt, which I am not wearing, or want to join the Cormac McCarthy course, of course, the links are down in the description below, and I will see you guys in the next video.